Good to see uh, each one here today. It's time to begin our class this morning. We're going to do so with a word of prayer. If you'll die with me, we'll pray together this time. Our Father in heaven, <clears throat> holy and reverend is thy great name. Father, to thee belongs all power and glory and majesty and wisdom. <clears throat> we are thy creatures. We are uh, so limited. And we're reminded every day. As we live in this life, how frail we are, how evil and confused and lost the world is, and how blessed we are that in your love and your mercy you've reached out to us, and that you've given us your word that any, that all who will may come and learn of thee and find a better way to live, a better way to die, a better way to, uh, to, uh, consider eternity and we're so thankful we deserve it not it's an act of grace and mercy and love but how blessed we are be thy children and we do pray that, that thy love might live in us and that we might show that love to others in a world father that <clears throat> thinks the answer to hate is hate and the answer to sin is more sin we pray that we might be wise not to allow bitterness to ever live in our hearts. That we might love our neighbor and even our enemy. That we might be more like thee and thy son. We do ask that you would bless us this hour. And help us, Father, as we open thy word to draw closer to thee. That we might uh, indeed uh, be made better for having been together. Pray later as we uh, worship Thee and as we take the Lord's Supper, as we sing songs of praise, we might do so in spirit and in truth. And we are mindful, Father, of our brethren who are not able to be here, those who are hindered uh, by sickness, by serious illness, some who are traveling. We do pray, Father, you would please be with them and bless them and help us to be mindful of ways we might be helpful to one, to one another. Forgive us, keep us, grant our petitions. We ask all these things, Father, in Christ's holy name. Amen. 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 Okay, we're studying Ecclesiastes, and we were looking at chapter 3 last time we left off. Ecclesiastes 3 is, is very familiar. These words have become, uh, I think, uh, often used in different contexts. 
To everything there is a season and a time, to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rent, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time <clears throat> to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace, and in these 14 couplets, you find opposites, don't you? There's living and there's dying and there's gathering and there's casting away. And the question is, you know, what is this saying? Is this uh, maybe some uh, uh, code or is there some lesson here to try to help us understand, uh, uh, you know, when it's time to pluck up and when it's time to weep? But I don't think so. As one fellow put it, I don't think that the passage is intended to be prescriptive as much as it is descriptive. Descriptive of what? Descriptive of life. Life is a one step forward, one step back, and, and it's gain, it's loss, and it's being born, and it's dying, and that's life under the sun. And what are we to do with all that? I think that's really the point of this passage. I don't think this is uh, to be put to music as an anti-war song or simply something to be put on some sort of a, uh, arts and crafts display. But I think there's a very deep and important lesson. And that is, as human beings, life seems contradictory. It seems confusing. It seems like a maze of experience. And here's the lesson. That a wise man knows that in all of that, God is the man. It's always the The next verse asks the question, what profit hath the man? Hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? Well, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? That sounds like chapter one. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher. All is vanity. Verse three of chapter one, what profit hath the man? Of all his labor that he takes under the sun. Properly understood, then, I think that uh, chapter three, one through eight, really is equivalent to chapter one and verse two, isn't it? What prompted the question in chapter 3 about what prophet? What prompted that question? Beg your pardon? In which he, the labor that he does, what does it profit him? Yeah, well, in chapter 3, yeah. What prompted the question? Yes, you're right. Well, basically, if, if we're looking at 1 through 8, we're saying that just very basic description to say, you know, what's right? Life happened. So what's the point? Yeah. So what prompted the question is there's a time to be born and a time to die, and a time to plant and a time to pluck up, and all those things. That's right. All the things in life. What prompted? In chapter one, what, what prompted the question? His statement, his declarative statement of what is true. Vanity of vanity. So I think it's fair contextually to say, what is one through eight? Really? What's the point of it? It's just another description of vanity of life. And life is sort of this circle, this endless chase. <clears throat> uh, planting and pulling up and good and bad and gain and loss. That's the point. And just like in chapter one, he comes back to the same point. He asks, what is the profit? Where do you find profit? Where do you find anything of value in an environment like that? Uh, what profit hath the man of all his labor when he had taken under the sun? In chapter 3 and verse 9, what profit hath he that worketh in that when he labored? He said, I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. He recognizes and introduces again the picture of God. He says, God has placed us in this environment. And so there's got to be something of meaning. 
in experiencing life as we do, with all of its gains and with all of its losses. God has given to the sons of men to be exercised. They were, that's familiar too, isn't it? Haven't we seen that before? Isn't that back over in chapter 1 and verse 13? I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are under the sun or under heaven. This sword travaileth God given to the sons of men to be exercised. There we there, There's a, got to be a purpose to this. Because God doesn't work purposeless. So what is the point? What is the lesson? What do we learn? What are we to gain from this experience of life that seems to be gain, loss, forward and backward? What's it all about? Well, again, go ahead, I'm sorry. Kind of like that cycle we talked about the water runs through and the sure. air runs. Yeah. It's it's a cycle. <laughs> different different language, the same principle. But he's going to add, I think, to that lesson. To the man who just sees life under the sun, there is nothing. It's, it all vanity and vanity. But you know, people who are not uh, so blind as to to leave God out still have to leave live in this life, don't they? So what lesson do we know? I think that's what the rest of chapter 3 is about. Um, if you begin reading with me in verse 10 now. Just read that. I've seen the travail that God has given such men to be exercised therewith. God's hand is in this. God has given us uh, this business, this travail, this trouble. You know, God did give man trouble, didn't he? <clears throat> where did all this, where did all this start? Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden. And, and particularly, at what point? <laughs> man, sin. And from that time, God has given us a world of life and death and gain and loss. And I'm sure this is something that you've contemplated before, but I think there's some folks that never thought about why. Just be mean to us. God gave man the trouble that he did in the world in which we live, I believe, to bring us to him and to keep us to it. And so I think that's what Solomon is alluding to. Verse 11. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God makes from the beginning to the end. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor, it is the gift of God. And I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it or anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Then in verses 16 and 17, Moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. And I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time for every purpose and for every work. Let me pause there. Yes, sir. I was going to say, go ahead. Don't let you pause there. I had to follow that too. Uh, go ahead. Well, you can draw, you can also draw a parallel here. You know, the word travail is also used as far as, as, far as just, uh, labor, child. You know, something hard, but there's, but there's something. There's a good and a happiness that comes at the end of it once you're done. Uh, you know, when you look back at it, there's another portion of this that kind of has, has ties back to the Garden of Eden, and that is God had always given man work to. You know, there they even before the fall of man, God made man and he gave him gave him work. And so there there's that, you know, we talked about, you know, enjoy the good of his labor and enjoy, you know, eat, eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor. And I think part of that is. I mean, you do work, you good work. Whatever you do, do with your life, you, you, you find a good work to do and you do it. And if you do it right, I mean, it, it, it's hard sometimes. 
but there's a satisfaction in, 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 in doing a good job and in, in showing, you know, God for you to do a good job and be able to, to sit and enjoy it saying, yes, I, I'm, I'm doing, you know, things that I, I've needed to do with my life. It's not the, you know, the, the guy that has a crooked job stealing from people or any of that stuff, you know, the folks that they just go out and they try to do things, do things for the betterment of themselves and for others, to work the job that they, that they work, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, some of the best rest you get at night when you're, when you're tired from a good day at work, where, you, where you've done right and you've gotten your work done and, and, you know, you're satisfied with that. And, and there is that good. And it's the same for, for the final rest. You, know, you, you live your life, you do your work right, and you'll get that, you'll have that same satisfaction in your final rest. And so, you know, like I said, it's just you pull a lot of parallels for that. I mean, if you, if you, the biggest thing that I get from as far as it goes is, you know, if you want to be satisfied with the work of your life, you make it a good work is necessary if you do it right. Right. You, you don't waste your time working on things that are they're just folly. <clears throat> you don't waste your time with things that you know are going to pull you away from the office. I think it, it is one lesson that we can't learn here is that two people in the same world have a very different life. Even if they make the same money and live in the same neighborhood, that's right. Uh, but I think here, look, look with me, you know, God has given this travail. And I think there's always a purpose to what God does. So why did God give the thorns and the brides? It's a curse. It is a curse. But I tell you, you know, God's like a good parent. He is the good parent. He is the ultimate good parent. You know, we don't discipline our children with the idea of mind of hurting them. We discipline all of them with the idea of helping them. And that's what this life is about. And that's what the description here that he's talking about really brings us back to. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Do you find that to be a state of heart of belief? Everything beautiful in his time? What beautiful? Uh, bright, comely, uh, but but beyond that, in season, suitable. Uh, one fellow said that the word uh, here for beautiful uh, means that, well, it, it's used in different ways. He said it's beautiful when referring to something physical like human appearance, Genesis uh, 39, when referring to actions and states like those listed in 1 through 8. The English term appropriate conveys the sense more clearly. He has made everything appropriate in its time. Now, there are a lot of ugly things that happen in life, but the promise here is that the God of providence makes everything appropriate in its time. Mr. Barnes says, fit in harmony with the whole of God's work. He made everything appropriate in his time, is the way the International Standard Version renders it. It's not the idea of just the fatalism or making excuses for God. It is the truth that we have confidence that in his plan, things that may be brutal and things that may be terrible and things that may be unpleasant, they are all part of a picture. Uh, I think a good example of that might be Isaiah 53 and verse 10, uh, where uh, we have the picture of the the sacrifice of Christ, of course, uh, 700 years before it happened. But it pleased the Lord to bruise him, Isaiah said. He hath put him to grief. Thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his name. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. That's always a shocking statement. When you think about the terrible death that Christ died. It didn't make him happy in the sense that he enjoyed seeing the suffering of Christ. But in what sense did it please the Lord? Yeah, with the result, with his result in that, obviously. And so it's, it's that way that we think about everything happening uh, in God's providence. Everything, the decisions that are made are woven together in order to work his purpose. Uh, I love this next statement. God has set the world in their heart. 
so that no man can find out the work that God made from the beginning to the end. Two parts of that. Number one, he has set the world in their heart. You have another translation of that, by the way? Yes, sir. Eternity. Eternity. The word is olam. And the word, frankly, has a variety of meanings. Uh, Brown Driver and Bridge defines it as long duration olam. Long duration, antiquity, uh, futurity, forever, everlasting, evermore, perpetual, old, ancient, world. So sometimes it's used in the sense of the world, which seems like it's been here forever. And sometimes it's used of that which is older than the world, and that which has no end, that which is eternal in its nature. It's a common word. It's used over 400 times in the Old Testament. It's used five other times in Ecclesiastes. It means ever is defined as, or is translated as old time, as long. But I think here, the sense of an endless existence uh, fits very well as it does other places in the scripture. Mr. Barnes writes, God has placed the inborn constitution of man in the inborn constitution of man, I should say, the capability of conceiving of eternity, the struggle to apprehend the everlasting, the longing after eternal life. When Solomon writes that God has placed Olam in the heart of man. I believe the meaning of that is that God has given to man a sense that, that there's more to his existence than what you can see and touch. I don't think that's something that we find in animals, for example. But it's something that we find in those creatures that God made in his image. He gave that to us. A sense of the eternal. Um... There is in every human heart, Brother Kaufman wrote years ago, a longing for eternal life and the instinctive certainty of it, no matter how primitive any tribe of man ever was. That inherent conviction that the, quote, great spirit, end quote, lives eternally has invariably appeared in worship and sacrifice. That is a good point to make. You know, we have some today who uh, are so proud of their atheism, you know, and uh, one fellow made the point, he said, do you realize what a tremendous minority you're in? I mean, not just of, of those on the earth now, but in the history of, of the world. If you lump together, let's just not, not make the distinction about the, 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 the true religion as we would understand, but just the idea of how many folks that have lived on this planet have believed in, in a higher power, something beyond us, and something beyond this life. And then you put over here the folks who deny any of that. This is a, it's a remarkable minority. And the question is, how do these folks get this idea? I mean, how do people dream up something uh, beyond this life and beyond themselves if, it, if, it, if there's no proof to it, if there's no truth to the matter? That's, a, I think, a fair question that Brother Cock was getting at. Yes, well, 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 the fact that, that the atheists would even consider different possibilities shows that <laughs> that they have this reasoning ability. They're choosing, you know, we, we deny this. Well, you know, and, and maybe they hadn't considered it fully, you know, whatever, how they got there, I don't know. But animals don't do that. They don't go, hmm, I wonder, you know, so 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 just the fact that they're that they're that they even consider or even reject it shows that they got the choice to, you know, it, to me, it, it points to the fact that it's in their heart. <laughs> you might find a group of black bears gathered around a garbage can. I don't think they're worshiping it. <laughs> They've got something else in mind. The question is why? Why is it man alone? All the preachers is a worshipful preacher. I think that is a fair question. Yeah, yes, sir. You know, they talk about evolution. Uh, God has a question. You know, what is the evolutionary benefit of being able to appreciate the beauty of nature? Be able to look and to see and to, and to, and to know, you know, the great harmony and everything else. <coughs> and yet, there's no other animal can. Even the ones that we call quote unquote intelligent, that are able to, uh, uh, you know, more complicated tasks and thinking and all that other stuff. There is, is absolutely no reason. Been given to even think there's anything else in this world 
that can stop and can appreciate the beauty of, of God's work like we can. Why else would it be? Why, you know, where, where would that come from? So God's placed that in the heart of man. That's right. But now he makes this point as well. This is a modern speech translation. It is beautiful how God has done everything at the right time. <coughs> how he has put a sense of eternity in people's mind. Yet, he says. Mortals still can't grasp what God is doing from the beginning to the end of time. And that's right. That we might be beings that have been uh, created with uh, a spirit that lives on. <laughs> and that we'll live on through eternity. But that we, we're made in God's image. But we're not God. <laughs> and we don't know what God is doing. And that's the point that he makes here. That we don't have a grasp of what God is doing from the beginning to the end. We know what he's told us. Yes, sir. Something may have happened to you today, and you're like, why? Why did this happen right. today? Six months from now, you're like, now I'll see why that happened. Or not. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Or not. That, that, and it may be. It may be that I say, oh, now I see. I think all of us, looking back on our life, we can say, well, I sure was blessed that I didn't get what I asked for back then. Or I was blessed by some trouble that I felt. Exactly. But if I never did. But here's the point. Solomon said, you just understand that even though you're made in God's image, you're not God. But you know this about God. That he will do all things well. What is that song we say? For I know whatever call that Jesus do with all things well. All the way my Savior leads. What a great thought that is. I know whatever call. Jesus doeth all the new. So, no man can find out the work that God makes at the beginning to the end. That is, the ISD reads, he hath placed eternity within them, yet no person can fully comprehend what God is doing from the beginning to the end. I like this quote from John Wesley, and I'll share it with you if you let me. He wrote years ago, he said, Many events seem to men's shallow judgments to be very irregular and unbecoming. As when wicked men prosper and good men are oppressed. But when men shall thoroughly understand God's works and the whole frame and contexture of them and see the end of them, they will say all things were done wisely. There are some more mysterious works of God which no man can fully understand because he, hath not, he hath cannot search them out from the beginning to the end. We're just limited in what we can know. But there are times when even we, limited as we are, can look back and say, God do all things well. So, yes, sir. I just think that Job, reflecting on, on Job, Job, everything in it, is a good, uh, <clears throat> a good reflection under this sir. Absolutely, yeah. Job is a great example of this principle of living. And uh, Job never did go. Why? He just was reminded of who. That's it. Yes, sir. Makes you feel good about all the money we spend on trying to figure out what, what what's really happening in the world and society or space or anywhere else, right? Because yeah. we'll never know all of it. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, too. Yes, sir. I think it was passage over in Romans 11 in regard to that passage you just made mention. He says, in Romans 11, 33, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches both of his wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. But who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him, all are all things to whom be glory forever. And of course, Paul's point in that context is, you know, you have the cross, you have a history of God separating Jew and Gentile, and you have that all in one kingdom. How the world did all that fit together? No, could, no man could ever come up with that. That's the wisdom of God. That's exactly right. Yeah, good point. Question and point for I was you was making mention about the atheists a while ago. Uh, I was thinking of the passage that we're in Romans 1 20 where he talks about the invisible attributes of God that are clearly seen. And he says that you're without excuse. You know, the the yeah. atheist is without excuse. I agree. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's pretty straightforward. Absolutely. 
the fool that said in his heart there is no God is a famous line from the psalm. And it is, it is the most foolish, the most unscientific, and the most uh, absurd position a man could hold. It's like denying that he's standing there. I'm not here. I'm not even standing here. Yes. I remember when we had Brother Stonehart here giving lessons and talking to him. And uh, he, uh, of course, knowing where he came from, of course, started teaching the gospel. Uh, he said, you know, many people in the atheist community are, are intellectual people. You know, very smart. They um, things of, of of the world they understand very well. But, but the main thing they're lacking, of course, is, is faith, and and they can't grasp the whole idea of God because they can't see God. Well, they don't think about creation. You know, it just it didn't just happen. I mean, this this yeah. everything around us is 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 God. I mean, we we see what He's created for people of faith, and and. Um, he said, you know, it, 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 it took him a long time to, to, to realize that and, and to see that and, and to believe that, to have that faith. And it's just sad that there's so many people, even though they are in an argument, there's still so many people that are outspoken that they yeah. don't have that faith. They, you know, they don't want to believe that, that there's God and the Creator. You made that point. I think that's a good way to say it. You know, we've said before, some problems are information problems and some problems are real problems. You know, sometimes I get off track because I don't know any better. And sometimes I know better. But, or I don't want to know better. And I think the will is a, is a major factor there. So that's a very good point to make. Yeah, those, uh, those atheists that you had on the board there a couple of weeks ago, yeah. I mean, yeah. those are formal atheists now. Right, right. Sadly, that's right. <clears throat> and uh, it, it's not, as you said, an intelligent problem, very intelligent people. No. There's another agenda going on here. A lot of reasons why, but it, it doesn't have to do, I think, with the fact that God hasn't given witness. That's for sure. So, what do we do? We live in a world that's filled with one step forward and two steps back, it seems like, and trouble and problem. What do we do? Well, again, the answer Solomon gives. Chapter 3 and verse 12, I know that there is no good thing in them but for a man to rejoice and do good in his life and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor. It is the gift of God. We come back to the point that he made at the end of chapter 2. We divide it into chapters. This point is a point that is made throughout the book. And that is that in the end, our quest is a personal quest and what we can do is we can submit to God and enjoy the day and take the blessings that he's given as blessings, but we're not building our life on them and our hope and our existence is not based on what we have. But I know that there's no good in them but to do this, to rejoice and do good. So when the times are plenty, we're thankful for that and we enjoy it. And when it's gone, we never expected it to be forever. Our hope is not here. Our life is not here. To take it all as the gift of God. This is an important, really important lesson. And one, as I said, that he dots throughout the book. Then in verse 14, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. What do you make of that? It, uh, there's nothing that man can do to uh, can upset his eternal purpose, uh, yeah. his providence. He's going to work through whatever, you know, even the very uh, dissatisfying things in life, wars. And, there's nothing going to upset his plan. I don't care how much people complain, how much they're so satisfied with what his purpose is going to be accomplished. And that's far from fatalism as we talk about with the ideas of, well, you know, uh, I went over there and robbed that store, but I, I mean, that's just meant to be. Fate just forced me. No, no, no. That doesn't take away human will. It doesn't take away the ability of, uh, of men to choose. But it does mean that whatever we choose, God ultimately is going to work his will. You might say, I got some questions about that. I do too. 
I think that's the point Solomon makes. We're always going to have questions about that. I don't know how God works all that out or how he does, but I do believe that he doesn't force anybody wrong or right. But in the end, whatever he does is forever. And he, his will, his ultimate will is going to be done. Yes, sir. You, know, you, you think back to children, the children of Israel down in Egypt, you know, Pharaoh was no, not going to let them go. And, and you know, God knew that, and he and he was able to use that event to show, you know, he the very thing that, you know, Pharaoh, I'm not going to let it happen. And God said, this is how I'm going to show my glory. This is how I'm going to to, to work my purpose. And, and, you, and you see that. He does. He, you think, well, how can he work with people that, that are opposed to him? He can do that. Yeah, always has. That's right. So let us have a thorough report about that. Now, this last phrase is one I want you to tell me. Yes, you will. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. And that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath been already. And God requireth that which is past. That's the old King James translation. You have another translation of that passage? God seeks what has been driven away. Yeah. Different translations of this lead us, I think, to some different understandings. Different lessons, all of which I think are true, which is intended here is the question for the student to, to find. Um, the old King James reads, God requireth that which is past. Which may carry the meaning of God pursues with vengeance the wicked. He requires deeds in the past. God, the NIV reads, God will call it uh, call the past to account. We understand the lesson there. That's the meaning of it. We understand what that means, which is what? God's going to judge. He's not going to forget the wickedness of the past. God's working in this world. And no matter what, we remember that God knows and that he will judge. He will, as chapter 12 reminds us, bring every work into account with every secret. Barnes says the meaning of this verse is that there's a connection between events, past, present, future. This connection exists in the justice of God who controls it all. There's another way, though, of taking these words. Uh, and that is that God will help the persecuted. Uh, God seeks that which is pursued, or the ESV. God seeks <laughs> what has been driven away. And if that's the proper reading of the passage, what uh, what does that bring to your mind? What's the lesson here? Yes, sir. Come see those who are heavy laden now and couldn't rest. Yeah. God is not going to forget those who have been troubled. And uh, there's another way in which this uh, comes out in some translations. Uh, Mr. Knox renders that he is ever repeating the history of the past, which is sort of a reminder that God's way of working may seem strange to us, but actually it's the way he's always worked. And so God is consistent. Men, because of our limited view and our, our self-centered nature, we might see it very differently. And actually, God is perfectly consistent with himself. This long road, God keeps <clears throat> on seeking what he's always sought before. God repeats what is passed away. So those are three possible meanings, and you can decide which you think fits best to you. But I think all of them are true about God and about his judgment, his providential work. Any question further about that? <clears throat> Okay, verse 16, I saw <coughs> under the sun the place of judgment, the wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, the iniquity was there. That's not good, is it? What does he mean by that? I saw the place of judgment, the wickedness was there. Um, I think he's talking about the law of the land, judge is in the land, you know, just like today, we got wicked judges and people in power and you see people that are not punished and adequately, and, and he says, I'm going to take, and next we're talking, I'm going to take care of all that. Yeah, yeah. And not only that, but and then you see in the last, in the last chapter, we talked about that each one of us as individuals is going to be judged. Right. 
But those people are going to be brought to judgment too. They're in the power of authority. You look for righteousness, but what do you see instead? We, we see it today. Wickedness, yeah. Wickedness, yeah. You, you, you look for folks to stand up and write, you don't find it. And so there's nothing new about that experience. Uh, but his conclusion is, I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time for every purpose and for every work. Yes, sir. On the last part, part you know, it's a, why are people allowed to do wicked then? Well, you know, God doesn't destroy people here, here on earth quite like that. He doesn't, you know, push people that way to pass. It's basically one of those, you know, He gives you enough leeway it is to do what you want to do and you destroy yourself. And so there's a time there for every, every purpose, every work. There's a time that God allows man his free will to do what he wants. And then uh, there's also a time for the judgment of that. Yeah. That's exactly right. People, today we hear the question all the time, why doesn't God abolish evil? If there's a God in heaven, why doesn't he, why did he deal with all this wickedness? And of course, I think the answer to that is he will. He absolutely will. It's a question of timing. And in his time and in his way, God is going to deal out justice. That's the promise of God. Uh, I like what Jameson Foster Brown wrote. He said, the judgment instantly, if, if judgment instantly followed every sin, which is what people seem to be asking for. By the way, they don't want it to instantly follow their sin. You have no sin. Mm -hmm. I have not at least been interested in God being quick to judge me. But I wish he'd judge you that way. If judgment instantly followed every sin, there'd be no scope for free will, faith, Perseverance of the saints in spite of difficulties. The previous darkness will make the light at the last more glorious. I think that's well said. That it's just not God's way. Generally, there are some exceptions to that. Yes, they have to remind you about that. Uh, but there are exceptions to that. But generally speaking, you know, God's justice may not come as quickly as, as I might like. But it definitely will come. I like what Henry wrote. He said, the judge will himself be judged for not judging right. That's the passage we're looking at. With an eye of faith, we may see not only that the period, but the punishment of the pride and the cruelty of the oppressors. It is an unspeakable comfort to the oppressed that their cause will be heard over again. Let them therefore wait with patience. For there is another judge that stands before the door. And though the day of affliction may last long, yet there is a time, a set time, for the examination of every purpose and every work done under the sun. Men have their day now, but God's day is coming. Now I think that's, that's a, a critically important point. Uh, let, me, let me look over in Psalm 37 uh, that he mentions here because it is a very good point. This is a passage that uh, talks about the patience and unjust circumstances and times. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him for he sees that his day is coming. I think the words of the psalmist are still true. And I believe that it's still so that you and I, uh, we, we have to, to, to live in the comfort of that fact. God's going to answer in his time. Nobody ever gets away with evil, not, not ultimately. Every deed will be, uh, will be judged. God will bring into judgment every work with every secret thing, good or bad. So, um, I said in my heart concerning the estates of men that God might manifest them that they might see that they themselves are beasts. I'd like to begin there next time. This is a really a fascinating passage. And, uh, and so give some attention, if you will, uh, to the remainder of chapter 3. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll begin there next time. Thanks so much for your help and your kind attention this morning.